With all that said, what I'm going to focus on is competition and contests. Contests have been the major driver of exploration through history. Ocean exploration, air travel, and space exploration. It's sort of contests do this. How, how does that happen? We'll talk about that. More information on the website, economicthinking.org technology. So let's first talk about exploring. What is exploring? It's an adventure. Anybody here like to explore? It's fun. You know, someone knocks on your door and says, hey, I just found this amazing cave down the street. It goes on as far as I can see. Do you want to go down and look at that with me? What do you say? Well, sure, but it's dangerous, right? So one of the things about exploration, it's fun, exciting, but can be dangerous. What are the economics of exploration? Economics is about incentives, about information flows, about coordination. This is how the economy runs in any, any sector. And the argument is market economics allows and encourages both competition and the search process, trying to find the best way, best computers, best music players, best software. Nobody knows you've got all these people trying to figure it out. People are still trying to figure out the best hamburger, right? Every, every week there's a new hamburger announced and people say it's better than others. But this searching process, trying to discover better goods and services, and entrepreneurship and enterprises drive economic progress as this is spread through the economy. We're looking at one sector now, space exploration. Turns out sound legal institutions and clear property rights are key as well. If you want people to invest in getting to the moon, they might want to know, can they purchase land on the moon? Right? There's a company that's selling real estate on Mars. You can invest now with this company, and when they get to Mars, you can have you know, like 50 square miles of land on Mars. It's a long story, but the question is, if you invest, are we going to get to Mars, and are you going to get your property? It's an open question, but the, the role of property rights, the role of contracts matters. We have the question of who's going to pay and how are you going to do exploration? Do you want large state-sponsored enterprises like NASA? Do you want a bunch of small firms, small teams competing in space? There's an article on exploring the ocean. A Liquid Robotics is a company that build ocean, builds ocean robots. I'm going to talk about that in a minute. I'm going to talk about the history of ocean exploration contrasting China and Europe in exploring the ocean in the uh, 15th century, 16th century. What's the main organizations that have been funding exploration for over a century? National Geographic. Rich people would subscribe to National Geographic, not just get the magazine, but become members. Someone would come and say, well, look, I want to explore the North Pole. I want to try and get to the South Pole. People would offer to fund that. And with that money, they would go do the exploration and come back and tell the story. Uh, the people who funded that were people that just liked exploration, liked knowledge. They were rich people just like the people that are funding space exploration today. So you can look at National Ge Geographic magazine to learn more. But our situation in space, the space program by accident started during the Cold War when one of the main reasons to get up in space is it was the high ground militarily. The idea is the Soviets, they got up there, they could drop a bomb, you know, drop bombs from space and land on uh, the US. There was a battle to get up in space first, part for exploration, but part for military reasons. The Soviets are gone now. Uh, there's still military concerns in space, but the topic is pushing more at just exploration that's not military oriented. Here's an article in Forbes about uh, this company. They hired a former NASA veteran who'd been working at Google. Liquid Robotics has robots going around through the ocean. They're, they're studying mammals. They're searching for terrorists in the, uh, off the coast of Africa. They're measuring temperature and other, other things, but they've got an inexpensive robot. Waves power it. When the waves go up and down, that pushes it forward. It's got solar power. But the key is it was a small company with a bunch of different people trying to figure out the best way to design a robot that would, that would explore the ocean. And nobody knows the best way. So you've got this team and maybe eight other companies that are building ocean robots. And they're trying to figure out the least expensive way to explore the ocean. Robotics in space, same story. Who's going to design those robots that work on the moon or Mars? Big national exploration things, by contrast, have a, have a uh, not so good a history. Uh, you've heard the term, someone is gung-ho, excited about that. That comes from the Chinese eunuch who started the Chinese major ocean exploration program. In the early 1400s, he had seven massive uh, trips to the ocean, boats that were way, way bigger than anything Europe had, massively larger than anything in the West. Um, compared to uh, the boats Columbus was on. These Chinese vessels explored the Indian Ocean. They were massive. However, 
It was a top-down exploration program, right? The, for prestige of China to collect uh, amazing things in other countries, it was designed from the top down. It wasn't self-funding. And the challenge is, it was incredibly successful technologically, but it bankrupted China. It cost so much money, after all the success of this, they basically lost more and more money doing it. The Chinese government basically said enough is enough. They, they canceled the program. They not only canceled it, they tried to erase it. They destroyed all the ships. Um, they made it a death penalty for anybody to leave off the coast of China in a ship. They wanted to erase the memory because it, you know, it was, it was such a, it was successful, but at the same time so expensive that it was a disaster. And it's a, it's a lesson of a top-down program that didn't find a funding source as it worked. Core advantage of private sector space exploration, those guys are looking for money. They're trying to figure out how do we make money going into space so we can pay for building better rockets. And that's, the, that's a different system than the big national program that the Soviets had, that the Chinese had, and to some extent the US had uh, with the NASA. So who explores the Earth? I mentioned caves earlier. I don't know if you're interested in cave and Earth exploration going under the Earth. Right? If you're going to explore, you can either go up, you can go down, or you can go sideways. But that's about it, right? If you want to go down, you can go into the caves. If you were to ask, who wants to explore space and who would pay for it? Well, just go online. You find this incredible range of associations around the world that just explore caves. Uh, there's a national cave association. There's a bunch of national cave associations there in cities all over the country, all over the world. People spend a ton of money to travel to other parts of the world to explore caves. Those same people are willing to spend money to explore space. There's technology, there's firms. This firm is actually going into space with balloons. They basically put balloons on a spacecraft. They're trying to get into space inexpensively. Uh, you can look at their website. So they just sent a new uh, airship record for sending theirs as high as possible. You can sort of see the balloons lifting it. But their idea is, you know, we're, we're in this deep gravity well. It's expensive to get up. We spend most of the money just lifting fuel into space. How else could we get around that? Different companies are trying to find different ways to get up there without the huge expense of uh, current rockets. So there's their ship. And if you look at their uh, description, they say, you know, people spend millions of dollars to get into space. They did this with $30,000. $30,000 was the cost of this. They got 50,000, 60,000 feet up there on the edge of space, and their goal is to get way up there with small rockets that can just take off into space from there. Um, and it's a, it's a fascinating project. It's one of a, a zillion different companies that are working on this. But again, nobody knows the best way to get into space. This may be a bad idea, in which case the investors lose their investment. If it's a winning idea, it, it makes money, and it's exciting. We don't know, but these are guys working on it. Interesting history, the Wright brothers. We think of the Wright brothers. How could these guys with just a few thousand dollars get into space? Well, the Wright brothers were bicycle mechanics, right? Uh, and you've heard this story, and through experimentation, and because they didn't have money, they did all sorts of innovations to keep costs down. You might not know that the government at the same time was funding airplane exploration, was funding Samuel Langley with a $50,000 grant to build an airplane. He was the country's leading scientist in the field. He was a reasonable guy to fund. He put a uh, barge on the Potomac and tried to use a catapult to launch his, uh, his guy into space. Uh, the first one, you know, marching band, crowd, uh, everyone's excited. It goes not too far and then crashes. He tries again. And the uh, second one again was a crash. And interestingly, this was just two months before the Wright brothers. So he, he didn't get more funding. He always claimed with more money he could have done it. But he, because he had more money, he went a different way at it than the Wright brothers. They didn't have money. They tried to do it inexpensively. And they succeeded. Interestingly, Samuel Langley, you know, the founder of the Smithsonian, it wasn't until 2003 that the Smithsonian acknowledged that the Wright brothers had flown. Samuel Langley ran the Smithsonian, and he did not, he believed he was the first one to fly, even though his plane didn't go very far, and he would not have any information about the Wright brothers, but finally, 100 years later, uh, the Wright brothers were acknowledged. And, and actually, they flew for years after their first flight. They were flying in Ohio. They flew along the train lines. People coming into Columbus would see the planes flying. They'd get into the city, and they'd go to the newspaper and ask about it. And the newspaper said it was impossible. You can't fly. 
Uh, this is weird. So even though they had succeeded, it wasn't acknowledged for a long time. But the point, expensive government operation, completely reasonable in terms of picking the right expert doing it. However, it didn't have the innovation and experimentation that succeeded from the private sector.